Welcome back uh, to video number two. Where we just left off was with the Ordovician period. Again, this is quite a long time ago, 487 to 444 million years ago. And the major point of this period was again that plants just colonized land, uh, allowing for subsequently animals to colonize land. Now we're going to jump a couple hundred million years. Uh, we're going to jump to the Cretaceous period. And you've probably heard about this period quite a lot because this is the dinosaurs time. Uh, dinosaurs were before this period as well. But when it comes to animal evolution, I'm really focusing kind of on the end of the dinosaur uh, reign of Earth, if you will. So this is fairly recent, as at least compared to the eras we were talking about, about 145 to 65 million years ago. This is really, again, the end of uh, the dinosaur reign on Earth. So we hypothesized that a meteor hit Earth and created a whole bunch of dust in our atmosphere. That dust darkened the skies, that reduced photosynthesis, and we think it was really a mass starvation event that occurred on Earth. Now this is incredibly important when thinking about dinosaurs because dinosaurs are huge organisms. The reason they dominated Earth for so long is because of their size. They were the main, you know, predators, whether you're an herbivore or a carnivore. Just because your size enabled you to get, well, well one, need more food and able to get more food the virtues versus smaller organisms. Anyway, so we have mass starvation that's going to lead to dinosaurs dying out. Another thing, too, is that with all of this shade, because of the dust, cold-blooded organisms like dinosaurs and other reptiles have a really hard time thermoregulating. These are cold-blooded organisms, meaning that their internal body temperature is uh, similar to the surrounding environment. This is why you find snakes laying on a road uh, during the day is because that road is very very warm and it helps to warm up the snake. Well you're now in a colder environment and the bodies of these dinosaurs cannot handle this colder environment. So this leads uh, to extinction of pretty much every dinosaur, especially talking about big things. However, although this sounds tragic and horrible, and what if we had dinosaurs, what it did lead to is a mass diversification of birds and animals, both, uh, or mammals, sorry, both of which are warm-blooded, and both of which were around during the dinosaur age. Now, people don't really think of that, because if you watch Jurassic Park, like, they don't show you little mice running around or anything. But we had mammals, we had birds, in this era, but they were small uh, and there weren't many of them because it was really hard to have a top predator mammal, a large mammal, when you had dinosaurs around that were huge and were foraging a lot. And it didn't leave much room for larger organisms of other phylas to really kind of get a hold and evolve. But with the dinosaurs out of there, we had so many niches left available. And, you know, once the dust settled from that meteor fall, we see huge evolutionary uh, changes to our uh, birds and mammals. Uh, so a huge change uh, in our animal system. And then finally, the last era we'll talk about is the Cenozoic era. This is the most recent one. It's from 65 million years ago to today. You and I both live in the Cenozoic era. So this is after dinosaurs went extinct, birds were diversifying, mammals were diversifying, and now our land plants are starting to diversify. It's during this era, early in this era, that we see land plants diversifying. Particularly, we see the rise of the phylum Anthophyta. Remember, that was our flowering plants. And we talked about how flowering plants had this co-evolution with insects and with birds that, you know, allowed each other to specialize for one another, enhancing pollinization of plants, pollination of plants. So, you have this co-evolution happening. It's currently happening. It's been happening for, you know, millions of years. 
And because of these flowering plants, we're seeing more diversification, particularly of insects and birds, and even to a degree mammals. Um, so this huge co-evolution event, all because of flowering plants, which we had talked about before, um, but still a fairly recent change in our structure of organisms, at least as compared to our first organisms 500 million years ago. So what I recommend you do, I would actually recommend you pause this video to do this activity. Uh, I recommend creating a timeline that has those major time periods. I have them outlined in yellow here. Uh, the years associated with those time periods, and then also important facts from those per periods. Uh, very similar to what we did with those uh, early scientists and their contributions to evolutionary thinking. Something I do want to make a note of, like I use the word period and era, those are like super technical words that you see in geology all the time. I don't care. I use the correct term on the test. You might just see Cenozoic or I might say Cenozoic period. Don't worry about if it's a period or an era. I just know that like key term. So anyway, I would recommend pausing here, look back through your notes and make an organized timeline of the information we just went through. Once you're done, come back here and resume the video. So go make that timeline and I'll talk to you soon. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you went and did that timeline just to help kind of organize your thoughts. So this was all about the actual evolutionary history of animals. How did we go from you know simple bacteria and plants to animals like you and me? Now the next thing we're going to talk about are just general characteristics of animals, ways we distinguish between different phyla. In the sub coming weeks when we get back from break, we'll talk about individual phyla of organisms, uh, but for now we're just kind of sticking to general characteristics that we'll touch on again when talking about individual phyla. So our animal classification, most of these things you see over here on the right hand side, we are going to talk about them. Most of them you've heard of. Uh, maybe not the scientific name of their grouping, but you've at least heard of the organisms found in these different phyla, which in my opinion makes it a lot easier versus studying our protists and even some of our you know, fungi and plants because they're not as common. So hopefully this unit is also just a lot easier because you already have some familiarity with the material. Uh, so one way that we can distinguish between our different animal groups is their symmetry. So you've learned about symmetry since elementary school. It's just talking about, you know, is there a line of symmetry? Is the left the same as the right, etc. So we have different types of organisms, some that are asymmetrical. They don't have a line of symmetry anywhere. And really our only animals that exhibit this kind of symmetry are our sponges. Although these two kind of sort of look symmetrical, they're not. There's no repeating pattern uh, or anything like that. And these sponges seem more symmetrical, but there's others that are just wildly asymmetrical. And these are our only organisms that have this asymmetry. Our next type of symmetry is radial symmetry. Think of radial, I think of a wheel. Uh, so radial symmetry. So some examples are jellyfish and sea anemones. So our jellies and our sea anemones. And you can see that it's essentially, they're, they're, it doesn't necessarily have to be round, but there's actually multiple lines of symmetry. I could cut the anemone this way, or this way, or this way, or this way, or any number of ways, and it's still symmetrical on both sides. Something about organisms that have radial symmetry is the way we separate them is a top and a bottom. Um, usually one of those sides uh, is the feeding side and the other side is the non-feeding side. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about our jellies. Now as you noticed, you know, we don't have that many organisms that are classified as having radial symmetry. In fact, it's really hard to come up with species that have this. 
mainly it's because these organisms are slow moving organisms. Sea anemones don't move at all. They're latched uh, onto a particular surface. Jellies move incredibly slowly. And so we think that the benefit to having radial symmetry is that you can experience the environment from all sides. If you're a jellyfish, you're moving very, very slow. You can't just turn around and say, oh, look, a predator, or oh, I feel waves coming my way. Maybe this is bad. They, they can't do that. Um, but they can feel from all sides. They have senses uh, radially, radi radially around them. So they can sense these things despite being slow moving. Same with our anemones. Uh, it can sense things despite being kind of stuck in one area. The last type of symmetry, which is the most common in our animal kingdom, is bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry is like everything else. Humans, for example, birds, fish, like most of the organisms that you think of have uh, two sides. They have a right side and a left side. A bi meaning two, and then lateral kind of talking about left and right or side to side. Now, this has a lot of benefits, which is why we see so many organisms with cephalization uh, or with bilateral symmetry, is because it allows for cephalization. Uh, ceph, the prefix C E P H, refers to a head. So, cephalization is the development of a head region. Because we have a clear left and right, we have a clear up and down, uh, we have a clear forward and backward. So we can develop nervous tissue in one centralized area of our body, aka really our brain. Um, different organisms will have different developments of the brain, but if you look at all of our bilateral organisms, they all have some sort of brain and they're all in the head region. Also, by being bilateral, uh, one, this helps you with movement. You can move in a direction. You have the flexibility to move in that direction. And your body is usually streamlined for that movement. Uh, you know, birds and fish, great example. You know, fish are streamlined to be able to move in a forward direction. Whereas, you know, our jellyfish, like they, they don't have a clear, I need to go this way because my body is adapted to going that way. It's just they, they, they just go, um, which makes them slower and makes it harder for them to move. So I'm going to pause here for now uh, and end this video here. So take a look at our third video.